last minute invitation to be out of town on Thursday. So I'm trying to see if I can have a makeup class on Friday afternoon at 2.30. Who would that totally throw out? What, what is the... I have a research meeting at 2 on Friday. 2? Yeah. When does it go to? Varies. <laughs> so 2.30 might work, but... 2.30 might work? Yeah. Are you... Presumably a research meeting would be small, that is your desires might count for something. Potentially. <laughs> I think in reality I would probably just miss part of the meeting, which would also be okay. <laughs> Very good. Um, let's do that so that we keep moving, otherwise we'll end up moving out next week. Let me do that, but I'll get Rush Misha on it. So, how about the default default location uh, here at stage. Sorry, this is four, this is five. Four, five. There's no one else have a conflict with that time. Or yeah, there's one conflict. Why, do you have a conflict? Yeah, I have a conflict. I think most of the older guys probably. Oh, do. don't tell me. There's a test. Wait, is there a test thing? Is that three? Yeah. It's a three. Yeah. Oh. Um, well, I can do 130, but that would still throw you out further, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, I can probably skip my meeting. <laughs> uh, it's only research. Yeah. <laughs> of course, that's why we have this fine device here. Yeah. You're almost missing nothing. Yeah. In fact, there are even better lecturers online. <laughs> There's actually some point, you know, we could just do tutorials. Like, uh, <laughs> the entire time could just be question and answers. Uh, Okay. okay, so that's that, and um, so where were we? We were I'd given you an example of some Grassman numbers, they're just matrices. I gave you these, if you wanted only two Grassman numbers, you could just use some Dirac matrices. And those are examples of Grassman numbers. Um, what are the rules of these Grassman numbers? Okay, so building up ultimately to doing Grassman path in the course of time. The rules of these Grassman numbers is, of course, that any Grassman number anti-commutes with any other Grassman number. No h bar or anything like that, it's gone. These are these classical Grassmann numbers. Um, that underlying this dumb statement is you can, can multiply Grassmann numbers Um, so you can you can have eta one, eta two, you can have products like this. And you can even 
even um, uh, superpose. So we have alpha of this plus beta. Two such products I can add and all. So it's not hard to quickly say what you can do with these numbers. Think of them as matrices, and then you know what you can do with them. Okay, you do the usual things. Um, uh, even numbers, even products. <coughs> It's like Fermi statistics, except because there's no H bars, it gets easier and easier. It's, 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 there are no little irritating things to keep track of. Pairs of these that are effectively like a bosonic. It's like a bosonic source or a bosonic C number, which is just a C. Um, and uh, and there was a question last time, which we discussed afterwards. I think Jack asked it in some form, but I forget exactly the way he phrased it. Which was, again, have, have I seen this before? Uh, ultimately, the question is, have I seen these numbers before or not? They sound vaguely like something I might have seen. Well, of course, they sound vaguely like the Dirac matrices, but, but only some pairings of Dirac matrices, because the Dirac matrices have, you know, there are several, first, there are several Dirac matrices. Indeed, they have anti-commutation relations. But there's something on the right hand side. Now, if you take pairs of them, like the example I gave you in a clever way, you can choose linear combinations so that you get rid of that and it looks like zero. So that's vaguely familiar. But the place where it's bang on exactly the same are the exterior, so there are the exterior forms. expect you, it won't hurt you, in fact it will help you, but I don't expect you to all know as prerequisite material what I'm talking about with exterior forms of differential algebra, of differential geometry, although you're all familiar with the kind of forms that you integrate. Um, but basically for those who do, you know that there are these, if you're in n dimensions, then there are these physics parlance, infinitesimal quantities, and you can form the volume element. If you're in n dimensions, not only can you have the line element, which is these dx's, linear combinations of these dx's, you can also say, well, I'm in n dimensions, and what if I had a uh, two-dimensional plane in n dimensions, or, or more generally, a two-dimensional surface in n dimensions? What kind of a volume element would I have, or an area element? I have? And the answer is, well, of course, it's pairs of these that would provide it. So you could have x dx i dx j. And for those who know, um, I think it's, most familiar example. it's very much like the way we use um, the cross product to define a um, the normal to a surface. So if you have a pair of vectors in a surface, even if they're not, even if they're not uh, perpendicular to each other, I'm 
trying desperately not to draw something perpendicular. So this is not 90 degrees. Okay? And you want to talk about this area element in a directional way. You all know what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to take the cross product of these two infinitesimal vectors, whose endpoints are orthogonal to it. And so, I think in your archaeodynamics courses, at some point, this kind of notation will be used to point to the unit normal. Not unit normal. It doesn't have to be unit normal. But the, uh, so, so if you here's the blackboard. Here are a couple of vectors that span this plane. Could have spanned this plane, but I've chosen to span this plane with these two vectors. And if you want to know the area of that parallelogram and its direction orthonormal to this, that's given by the cross product of these two vectors. You all know that. And that kind of, of course, the cross product is famously antisymmetric in these two vectors. So this is formalized, even if I were doing a three-dimensional subspace of a ten-dimensional space, the analog of that construction is given by these wedge products. Okay? So for example, if this is this is this product is defined to be antisymmetric in that in that wedge. Okay? And so there's a formal construction that's used in differential geometry. It's a very simple construction. If you want, for example, three-dimensional space and you want the volume element in this sense, the directed three-dimensional parallelogram, parallel parallelogram, whatever, with a direction to it. It's given by this kind of construction where formally this is antisymmetric and this, this, and this. So it's antisymmetric on IJK. Um, and uh, so in that sense, these DXs are kind of of course, there's nothing wrong with multiplying a particular dx by alpha. Or if you're talking about alpha dx1 plus beta dx2. After all, you might need that. Suppose you're doing a line integral. Then the line integral right here, this little dx that I'm integrating, might not be oriented in the 1 or the 2 direction. It's a linear combination. So you may need to do things like this. So, this is a very natural way of seeing that there are these dx's. You can multiply them. When I say multiply, I mean in this wedge product sense. Just like the vector product is a kind of multiplication. Okay. Um, it's antisymmetric. This multiplication is antisymmetric. Uh, this dx is not to be thought of as just some number. This, in, in this context, it's got some formal meaning of directionality. Okay. Uh, so this is a number, but this is not. Okay. And um, the algebra of these so-called exterior forms, that's this and this and, and the, the product that you make, uh, the algebra of these exterior forms is identical to this algebra we're talking about here. Okay. So, for those who are vaguely familiar with this, this is exactly this. And, and for those who are not, just forget I said it. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so I guess one other thing about exterior forms, which I'm guessing maybe isn't true for Grassman numbers, is for exterior forms, you can only take three wedge products before everything gets killed. Or like if your forms are in three dimensions, you can only form no, no, no. three. That's absolutely true for Grassmann numbers. So now let me come to that point, okay. which is um, how big. So I said this is exactly, I mean exactly in every property you know, the same here as here, with one little qualification, which I've made in the past. How many of these dx's are there? Well, if you're in n dimensions, there's n. Um, and indeed, it's true that if you have n of them, once you've done so let me put I1, I2, I3 up to dx, I, n. Once you get this much, that, that's OK. But as soon as you do this, by the total antisymmetry 
because it's got to be totally anti-symmetric, and there's only n possible things that these n plus one indices have to choose from. This has to be zero. Okay, and indeed that is true here, but only in the discretized sense because the number of dimensions we need is the number of Grassmann numbers we need to define a Grassmann field. So behind these Grassmann numbers, as I said last time, we are after we're after a Grassmann field. That's where we're headed. But a Grassmann field is a Grassmann is at least a choice of a Grassmann number at every point in space time. Now, that's a hard number to count, the number of Grassmann numbers that we need. But if I discretize space time and work in compact volume and work between two times, then you know there's just a very large number of Grassmann numbers. So the dimensionality of this, if you want to think of this as a perfect analogy, and it is perfect, at least if you discretize space time, this n in this analogy corresponds to the number of points in space time. So there, again, these analogies are tricky because there are two spaces, and each of them you might mistake as space. I mean, you could think. There is a space I'm talking about, exterior forms describing geometry or geometric considerations in very simple volume element considerations, in n-dimensional space. But this is not the n-dimensional space we live in. This is some fake space. <coughs> the n there, how many dimensions, this is, how, how many dimensional space is it? It's quadrillion dimensional space. But then if I did a quadrillion plus one exterior derivative, now, you'll be glad to know we don't have occasion to do that. Uh, but, in these condensed matter kind of where, where really the space-time is, you know, you're living on a crystal or whatever it is, where the space-time truly is finite dimensional. I mean, the, the number of points in space-time is finite. Is finite. Um, then it really is a perfect match, and e even down to the little fine point dimension. So, there it is. Okay, um, as I said, this is just, it, it always is useful. This is a very alien type of number. For those who have already absorbed this, then it becomes instantaneous that you understand what kind of number I'm pointing to. For everybody else, I'd rather you think in terms of these kind of matrices, where you can imagine matrices which have this property that they anti-commute. Um, it's just that there would be very high dimensionality, so we stop writing them as matrices, and we just go around calling them numbers with certain axioms. And that's how we are going to play, OK? Um, and in perturbation theory, it's going to get even easier because we're only going to, there's only one kind of integral we ever have to do, and that's uh, Gaussian integrals. So let's do the integrals, integrals over Gaussian, uh, uh, integrals over Grassmann. So Grassmann integrals. Um, and of course, this is why you could not, you know, it was, would have been very reasonable. Somebody has brought me an anonymous present, but <laughs> apparently not. Okay. Um, but but why are these marker pens here? Um, so the classic thing is you want to do an integral. So I should have said here these are this. So these are these are also C numbers. So C number superpositions are perfectly OK. Again, if you just think matrices, you don't need to be told all this. And if you think exterior forms, you don't need to be told you know all this. Uh, Grassmann integrals are uh, things like this. Some function of theta. Now, um, we need to define what this is. Again. Ultimately, the definition is very self-serving in the sense that in a very simple way, we are going to get the Fermi statistics Wicks theorem. And that will be the proof 
that everything we are positing is the right thing. Okay, But right now, it sounds like I'm just making up the rules. But let's do it as if we're trying to make up the rules in some enlightened way. We're at least trying to guess what rules we should have. I've tried to give you various hand-waving reasons why we are thinking that Grassmann numbers are relevant at all for Fermi statistics. Now we have to do path integrals. So we are thinking, OK, he's going to know how to do an integral. And, um, but if you have a, a function of theta, we can tailor expand. And here's where Grassmann integrals become enormously simpler than ordinary integrals. Because if you tailor expand the integrand, you can expand in the zero ter order term in theta, and then the first order term in theta, and then the second order term in theta, and so on. However, since theta squared, so theta is a Grassmann number. But by second order, theta squared is 0 by the axioms of Grassmann numbers. And so every um, Taylor expansion stops right here, which makes it look a bit of a joke. But anyway, it's true, right? So, um, so in fact, to define Grassmann numbers, I just have to define. So, so then, then the we're going to say, we're, oh, I should say that these are, are C numbers. In other words, you're doing a Taylor expansion of powers of theta. You're thinking of theta like a matrix, right? Imagine you were doing e to the uh, Pauli matrix times some angles or something. You write the Taylor series. Even though this is a matrix, you write the Taylor series, etc. Of course, there are some C number coefficients in the Taylor expansion. That's how you should think of this. This is Think of theta as some grandiose matrix. We're just writing it out. But of course, in the Taylor series, there are going to be these coefficients. But there is one rule that the square of this matrix is 0. So it just gets pretty simple. That's all. Um, but it's very much in the spirit of Taylor expansions or other matrix functions that you've seen in your life. Okay. Uh, so, but these are the C number coefficients. And so what we'd like is that it's linear. That as usual with integrals, the C number coefficient can just be pulled out. The integral of 2 sine x is 2 times the integral of sine x. That's the property you think we would like. And so we're left to define two Lego blocks of Grassmann integration. This and this. If I know what these are, then I'm set. I have my axioms. Um, so, what is the, uh, the, the last consideration, the last axiom that we want? Um, sorry, I, I, sh I should say this. In fact, this is the C number. Sorry, let, can, can I correct what I said, or rather generalize what I said? This could be or a G number. I don't care. In other words, as long as these coefficients are not the thing being integrated, but then I have to amend this, uh, this expression. Um, I should really just write it like so, so let me, let me correct it. Um, just write it These are, again, these are the baseline uh, integrals that I need to find, where whether it's plus or minus depend, depending on whether A, B are C number or G number. 
In other words, if A is like the number 3, then you just get 3 times the integral. However, if this A is itself a Grassmann number, then yes, you can pull, it's a coefficient which is not being integrated, so you could pull it onto this side of the integral. But, but because this is a Grassmann number and this is a Grassmann number, to get it to this side, you actually have to anti-commute it through, and that produces a minus sign. Similarly here, integral d theta of b theta, but to pull that b through the d theta, since the d theta is also Grassmann, this is a g number differential, um, we have to get a minus sign. Yeah. Um, so the d theta can't be the same as the the d for differential forms. Like if theta was a differential form, that would be yeah. So notice the analogies, which sometimes are more confusing <laughs> not having mentioned it. But, but notice, this d theta looks like a differential form. But I've been telling you that theta itself, theta numbers, are themselves, the algebra of them is isomorphic to differential forms in a heck of a lot of dimensions. But now, I have to introduce a kind of a, uh, a differential form of Grassmann type which is compounding, which is really saying, which is not to be confused with this space here. This is C number differential forms, meaning you never heard of Grassmann numbers. These are just differential forms for doing standard old geometry, which happen to be isomorphic to Grassmann numbers. And this is me introducing the axioms of something yet more sophisticated than Grassmann numbers, which is Grassmann differential forms. Indeed, there is a kind of a more general space of differential forms, where you have differential forms involving both differential of C numbers and Grassmann numbers. And this is roughly a kind of a, a I think they're called like graded differential forms. Or some some word similar to that, um, and indeed they are part of the geometry of uh, supergravity, for example. So differential forms in superspace. But so that's what that thing would be. That's what it, that's the, it would be. It would be one of the simplest objects in that kind of graded differential form space or graded. Superspace, I'm sorry, superspace differential forms. It is a member of a superspace differential form. Mm -hmm. But let me then shut that and speak it off. <laughs> I, say, uh, I am telling you, we are trying to do, you know, where are we coming from? We're not, we're, we're, we're trying to make sense of some sort of anti commuting field, right, which is related to our anti commuting sources, that we can do path intervals where the h bar has been thrown out of Fermi statistics. Okay, that's where we're coming from. And now we're trying to guess what the rules of such a path integral would be. The proof that it is the right rule will be that it gives the right time and diagrams. But we haven't come there yet. But we're trying to guess. And we're saying, well, at the very least, to even figure out what we should do, we better have that this seems like the plausible thing. Okay, there's something that's like this. And we're guessing that what we mean by the differential of theta is itself physics language, when I write dx, we just think that that's a c number. Okay? In the same sense, I'm pointing to d theta and saying that's a g number. Yeah. Um, so the other thing I was worried about, you said a could be a c number or I guess an odd Grassmann number. Couldn't that be like 1 plus theta naught and then you're... Indeed, you indeed. So, so, so another example would be integral d theta of one plus eta times, uh, say, one plus theta. Okay, well, fine, let's multiply it out. This is one.
1 plus eta plus eta theta plus theta. Okay? This thing in matrices is associated with the rule of multiplication. Of course, we all know it. I'm not just treating it like matrices. Everything you don't know, think of it as a matrix, except there are certain products of the certain rules that you know for which matrix it is, like the square of the matrix is zero or attributes with any other uh, classroom matrix. Now, to do this integral, um, I just keep using, so now you see it breaks up. As long as you were saying integrals are added, you can add the integrals. The integral of the sum is the sum of the integrals. As long as we have that rule, then it tells you what to do in each case, right? So for this one, it's like this rule with the minus sign, right? I can do integral d theta, but the eta comes out with an extra minus sign. So yeah, I can make my a a linear combination of Grassmann and C numbers, but just because the sum of the integral is the integral of the sum. Is there like is there any use in defining something similar to like a complex conjugate so you could just say that that thing is like a bar where you switch all the odd Grassmann parts, the sign of all the, the does that make sense what I'm saying? Because the way it's written, you have to break the integral a lot, but or you could say that when you commute it past. I, I don't know if there's some... Um, so people don't do that? They don't, because as you'll see, the kind of integrals we're going to get, we're just going to work out the answer, and then we're sort of... We don't need to go down to this machine code level of hard once we get it set up. So I don't see a lot of discussion. So our job is to define this, but actually uh, there's another relation that I say that we want that reasonable people could have expected. Again, the proof is to come, but, but and that is that uh, it's been very useful in all our path integral manipulations to say that you can shift the integration integral. So. integral, so we like, we would have thought it was reasonable, that integral d theta of f of theta plus eta, that shifting the, so we would have thought that this is, by using theta prime, is Theta plus eta we would have thought that this was a reasonable rule. If it was a regular integral, then this change of variables, which is shifting the integration variable, which we've been using left, right, and center for all our C number integrals and all our manipulations, um, like completing the square, and this half integral, all of these things. Well, it would be nice if that was still true, okay? In which case, just, just so, but the most general F is already there on the board, and so that implies that integral d theta, so um, let me just write, well, let me write this one down. It's, plus or minus a integral d theta of 1 plus or minus b integral d theta of theta plus or minus b integral d theta of eta. So, if I write this out, but instead of f of theta, I've got f of theta plus eta, then instead of theta here, I'd have theta plus eta. But then it's a sum, and so I would just write out like this. That has to be equal to this thing, where theta prime is just a dummy variable. So it's plus or minus a 
integral d theta um, okay and of course even this since it's not an integration variable I could just put it there and put one and if you compare and this eta is arbitrary variable this thing so this thing has to equals yeah, so this thing has to be zero which means there's one less integral that we need to know the answer this this thing so, so therefore therefore what we want is integral d theta of one equals zero and integral d theta of theta that's, I still don't know the answer to that. But I know it's a C number by thinking of this as the Grassmann number. And this is another Grassmann number, then the product of Grassmann number, of two Grassmann numbers, of an even number of Grassmann numbers, is a C number. So I just have to tell you which C number it is. And um, the con so convention, it's one. If I put two, we could have redefined the measure d theta absorbed it, got a modified thing and said it's two or whatever. So these, other than thinking of thetas as kind of matrices whose commutation relations you know, namely they all random commute, um, this tells you how to do any other Grassmann interval. Boom. Okay? There's only one rule to remember. There's this, and then this is the only non-zero thing you have to remember. Um, Okay, so again, this is another example. What about multiple integrals? Multiple G number integrals. Uh, well, let's not belabor it. Let me just do an example and say you get it. Well, um, let me try and do the eta integral first. So that is equal, but from the eta integral point of view, the theta is just some coefficient. It's not being integrated. So that's minus integral d theta, theta, integral d theta, theta. Okay? And so that's minus 1, because each of these is 1. Other than this rule, uh, you, you figured out how it works. Okay. Um, okay. I deliberately uh, sloughed over what kind of C number superpositions you can have. Okay. So, are they real number? So, can you have eta plus theta? With alpha and beta. This alpha and beta C number coefficients to make interesting linear combinations. Um, well, we know where we're headed in quantum mechanics. We'd like all these things to be complex. And indeed, I have in some sense told you only about um, real Grassmann numbers. So, so So far, these were real Grassmann numbers. Now, complex Grassmann numbers. Um, so, it, which, which is just saying that theta star does not you shouldn't you shouldn't use the if you thought that theta star should be theta well don't think that think of it as something independent okay so you don't have that relationship 
But there are some standard relationships like theta, eta, star. You see, secretly, since every theta is a kind of grand matrix, right? When I say the word star, I should, you know, in, uh, I hate to write this, in matrix language or Grassmann numbers, theta star corresponds to theta dagger. Okay? If I think of these, think of my favorite example of two Grassmann numbers given by some Dirac matrices, by some sum, some combination of Dirac matrices. When, I, when I'm checking whether theta star is theta, what I'm really doing is taking the matrix theta and taking its Hermitian conjugate dagger and asking if it's the same as the original matrix. So there are two levels to read this. First, when you do examples with finite dimensional matrices and a finite number of points in space time, what I'm, what I'm pointing to here is that a certain Grassmann matrix is not its own Hermitian conjugate. But we are trying to formalize, since we have a continuous infinity of space-time points, as far as we know in nature, I have to formalize so that we don't keep talking about the word matrix, but we work with the notion of a Grassmann number with sort of an axiomatic definition. And in that sense, we just use the notation star, and the star just, but, but every manipulation of the star is like matrix staggering. So get used to that. So just as an example, what about this? Theta, eta, star. What does it mean? Well, just think dagger and you won't go wrong. It is equal to eta star, theta star. See, I switched the order. By the way, order matters, as you now know. I had to switch the order and then star each, just as if it was Hermitian conjugation of matrices. Okay. So this is a quick rule where I don't have to spend three lectures defining the axioms of Grassmann numbers. They're just matrices. And, uh, um, and you can think of these so. You can, of course, just like always, you can think of a complex Grassmann number as equal to a real Grassmann number. I mean, a, a, a linear combination of real Grassmann numbers like this. I don't want to be as nuts and bolts about it. A complex number is like this combination, a real, a complex Grassmann number is like this, where these guys are real Grassmann numbers. By which I mean that theta 1 and 2 <coughs> star does equal theta 1 and 2. Okay. So this is the move to, grass, to complex Grassmann numbers, which are much more useful just because all of our Fermi fields are complex. Okay. The Dirac equation has got lots of complex numbers in it. The Dirac matrices have complex numbers. Um, so then let's just do um, the analog of these integrals. these complex. So integral d theta star d theta. Remember I did complex scalar path integrals and I said it's nice to think instead of integrating over x and y, you integrate over z and z bar, where z is equal to x plus i y over root 2. And you think of z and z star as sort of independent integration variables formally. So this sort of integral over z dz star is now generalized in this way to a Grassmann version of the same thing. Okay? And uh, so we'd like to define integrals of this sort. And um, now, in a sense, it's already defined. Because 
because I've already told you the real story, real in the real complex sense of the sense of the story. I've told you the real version, and the complex things are just derived from these limbs. But let me summarize what happens if you didn't bother to do the exercise, and that is that uh, integral d theta star d theta. Oh, so first I should say, um, well, here, uh, some function of theta and theta star. Think of it as theta one and theta two, but I'm organizing it in these combinations, okay? And now, because there are two things, uh, or, or theta is complex, there are two, well, the Taylor expansion gets fractionally more interesting, okay? So it's equal to A plus B theta plus real function, right? So just some other thing. Theta star plus. Now, if it was real, then we'd stop with just linear and theta. But but now there's a new possibility, which is theta, theta star. I can't say that that vanishes. In fact, it does not by our axioms. You can write this out in it, you, you'll see that if you write theta, theta star out, that there's a theta 1, theta 2 possibility. And there's no activism. You can't say that theta 1, theta 2 is 0, because they're different real Grassmann numbers. So because theta is not theta star, I cannot, if theta was theta star, I could just say this is theta squared, theta squared is 0. Throw it away. But theta is not theta star. Or, under the hood, theta 1 is not theta 2. And so, this is not vanishing. Okay, so I've got to keep it. But that's it. Everything else, you can, you know, you can say, what about d theta squared theta star? Well, square of a Grassmann number or square of a linear combination of Grassmann numbers, it's Grassmann, it's zero. So, so this is it. But that means I have to, well, I can either go and just write everything out in real language as an exercise. Or I can just t tell you what, what this is, what, what each of these things turns out to be. So, we can almost do it in our heads, okay? The A is going to get integrated to zero by that shift argument again. The B theta, you might say, well, theta, theta is a linear combination of theta one and theta two, but I'm integrating over both theta one and theta two, so one of them is unhappy. And so it's also zero. Same, same with this. But here, this theta theta star is secretly like a theta one theta two. Okay, that's the. If you wrote it all out in real components, it's only the different thetas that could be multiplied without being zero. So that would be like doing integral d theta one d theta two or theta one theta two. It would be exactly like doing this integral. In other words, it would not be zero. And indeed, that's, that's the case. So there's just one non-trivial answer, and um, it is the way, correctly, it's equal to C. In other words, the crucial integral is one. So the quick way of doing it is integral d theta star d theta of theta theta star, where it's in the opposite order. Theta star on star on star star is, is, is one. Um, indeed, uh, let me, um, that's let me see, the I mean, I, I, in the end, of course, I won't care, but, but let's be honest. Well, when you define integrity major, yeah. for the measuring part, you have to divide by i, so that will basically cancel as well. Oh, you want to say, oh, yes, sorry, it's, it's the other place I screwed up, there. Uh, when we wrote that one out, I think we also had this question of an I being out. So, yes. Um, so, fine. We want to know what this, we want to know how this is defined. And, and, and this, this is 
this is the definition. If you don't, if you want to say it's a derivation, then there's really an I or off by. <coughs> Um, okay, tough integral to do next, a Gaussian integral, okay, because uh, as we will see, this is, this is what everything is going to turn into in perturbation theory. Um, so, example, but not just an example, it's the example is uh, integral d theta star d theta. So, 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 so maybe I should just say here, absorbing <coughs> an i in <coughs> d theta star d theta relative So, for example, um, well, this, this is the uh, here is a nice Gaussian integral where this is a C number. Okay, one dimensional Gaussian integral, but this is equal to, well, can do the Taylor expansion of this, it's just an exponential. So this is 1 minus d theta star theta, full stop. Can't go to the second, I can't go to the next order of this exponential expansion because it's going to vanish. Okay? And so the net integral, well this doesn't have an integral, this integrates to zero, and so we get a, uh, but, but notice being a little careful. There's a theta star here. Here, the theta star and theta are ordered oppositely to this. So there is a minus sign that cancels that minus sign. And the answer is B. Now, at some point or other, I have to do this. Okay, let's do the uh, multi multi-dimensional Gaussian integral, which uh, we don't we don't need just yet, but it's going to be very useful later on. Okay. Um, Sorry, can you say it real quick again? Why the minus sign in the way? Because it came because when I expanded, it's theta star theta, whereas the thing that integrates to one is theta theta. Star. Um, Okay, so, so far it's all been quite trivial. There's a lot of formalism per unit output. Uh, this, however, is non-trivial. But the, it looks innocent enough. An n-dimensional complex, oh, I should say one thing uh, just before we do this. Since I opened the Pandora's box of differential forms. Um, Differential forms that most of you learn about are for real manifolds, meaning like this space or space in five dimensions. Okay? Uh, of course, you can live in complex space. You can live in complex vector spaces. And you can define complex manifolds. And if you go to the appropriate parts of the campus, they'll do it. But that means that there are complex differential forms, not just dx, but dz. So the complex Grassmann numbers are isomorphic. The algebra of those is isomorphic to the algebra of complex differential forms. Okay. Not to be confused with the d thetas. This is the amount. So, so oh, I've said that. I'm not using that. 
Um, okay, so we want to do an n-dimensional <coughs> interval where there's one to n like this, and then d theta one to n. Now, since Gaussians sort of factorize into just one-dimensional Gaussians, it might seem that I'm not got a lot to talk about. Just keep reading the <coughs> result. But it allows us to write a Gaussian integral in an interesting form, meaning sum over i and j of theta i star. In other words, instead of b being a number, it can now be a matrix, an n-dimensional matrix, uh, b i j theta, or if you want, theta dagger b as a matrix theta. Okay, so things like this are about to come our way, um, but. Um, where these are C numbers. Again, you've got to make sure that you've discussed and thought about it enough to not get mixed up with the statement that this B is a matrix of C numbers, and the fact that theta in matrixy language is a matrix. Okay? Their, matrix their matrices are very different type. Anyway, I won't say more. I think it's obvious, but, but just sometimes in the middle of rushing through some problem, then you, you may mix one with the other. Um, it's better to think axiomatically about Grassmann numbers and then reserve the notion of matrix for many